All right, Farley. All righty. Excellent. All right, well, we might get started. Thanks everyone for coming along and uh, thank you too to everyone online for joining uh, today. So as we begin, I just wanted to, uh, and on behalf of TRI, pay respects to the Turrbal and Jagera peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Brisbane area. We recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. We pay respect to the elders pre past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and commit to fostering a culture of learning from and working with First Nations people in the spirit of reconciliation and access to justice. So again, thank you for everyone for, for coming along. And today, uh, this is our second uh, partnership seminar series uh, where we're focusing on translating from target to clinical trial and uh, some of the mechanics and uh, processes that we need to uh, be aware of and understand as we go through um, this, this journey. And to help us uh, learn about this, we have uh, four excellent speakers today who we're all very thankful for uh, coming along to join us uh, and um, share their experiences and uh, perspectives. And following, following our four speakers, we've uh, been lucky enough to have uh, three panelists, many of whom you will know, uh, who also have uh, uh, an experience in the journey of translating the clinical trial. Uh, and I'll introduce each of these uh, people uh, one by one. And first up, I'll just invite um, uh, Dr. Mark Reed from Graythan Regulatory Services up as our first speaker. Uh, just as a, a way of background, um, Dr. Reed is a founder and managing director of Graythan Regulatory Services, a regulatory consulting operation focused on establishing, helping established companies and startups create value along the drug development pathway. Uh, in this, in this role, um, Dr. Reed has obtained eight drug vaccine and drug device approvals to date in Australia, Europe, and the USA. He's also the co-founder and managing director of Amivas Incorporated, which is a US-based by a pharmaceutical company. So I'll invite uh, Mark up. And uh, just to say, we'll have a question and answer time at the back end. Uh, so thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone. So I'll, I'll speak in the context of, uh, you know, growth and regulatory services and what I've been asked to present today. So perspectives on early stage clinical development. This is a very broad sort of area. So. Um, I'll try and give some uh, points about what we're doing in Amabas as well, because we're sort of focused at stage four, you know, our phase four in our Amabas program, but through Grayton, we're, we're actually working on phase one clinical trials. So there's this spectrum of clinical trial development that we're doing, um, but it all sort of ties into some of the points I'd like to make today. Um, so here we go. So I'm just going to keep this agenda quite brief. Uh, why would we undertake a clinical trial? That might be news to some members of the audience. It won't be for others. I know there's some very experienced trialists in this audience. Um, I'll review the stages and then the objectives of each stage and giving you an insight into times and costs. And then maybe just the, the gold nugget slide, which is really some take home thoughts for success, particularly as you uh, uh, anticipate going down this journey of conducting your first clinical trial, if, if that's your case. So why would we undertake a clinical trial? Well, firstly, it's a regulatory requirement for a marketing of a commercial product. Um, so this is what drives the phase one to three development cycle. Uh, we are required, the drug companies, I'm the CEO of a drug company, to answer post-approval questions. Um, these typically come in the form of FDA post-marketing commitments or post-marketing requirements. Um, Often we're just developing the evidence base for best clinical practice. Uh, these, are, these are what's referred to commonly as academic led studies. Um, this may diverge into an area where there's an off-label off claim with an approved therapeutic, leading to extensions of claims down the track. Um, and these studies are generally conducted to ICH um, E6R2, which is good clinical practice uh, in Australia, and particularly the national guideline or the national statement and uh, other key guidelines, depending on where you're operating globally. So what are the stages? I've broken this up by uh, pre-approval and post-approval. Uh, phase one to three are the pre-approval steps for approval of the drug. At phase one, these are the very early stage studies. They're typically in healthy volunteers, but sometimes in patients, depending on the toxicity of the compound in question. Um, they include the first in human studies, and we're typically looking between 20 to 100 people in these trials. At phase two, we're looking at a larger cohort of uh, people, 
uh, moving into the patient population. And we're de generally dealing with several hundred patients. And then in phase three, these are the late stage studies. Um, they're performed in several hundred to several thousand people, depending on the risk benefit ratio of your, of your product. And uh, they're pre-registration studies using the commercial formulation, which I know other speakers will touch on uh, during their presentations. Uh, phase four is often a post-approval study, and it's it may range from small registries, pregnancy registries, for example. I'm conducting a pregnancy registry in, in Paris and the US at, at present. And effectiveness studies, they, we want to see evidence that the drug that's been efficacious in clinical trials is actually effective in the general population. So if, if we're talking about what, what are our objectives at phase one, uh, these are my dot points. There's other dot points, but these are the things I focus on. Um, we're, we're trying to determine what are our very common and common adverse events. These are treatment related adverse events. Uh, we're developing our dose and schedule. It's really ideal to have a drug that's uh, target specific and uh, we can deliver it repeatedly without excessive toxicity. Uh, we want to determine the maximum tolerated dose that's important for certain compounds such as oncology drugs, chemotherapy. Uh, we want to determine whether the drug inhibits the target pathway and look for those pharmacological signals in the, in the tolerated dose range. Uh, we want to measure our pharmacokinetics uh, and often it's easiest to then titrate that dose, uh, that free uh, plasma concentration back to our target, which is inhibited in our preclinical systems. Um, and sometimes, depending on our patient population and our compound, we can look for early efficacy signals. Often in oncology studies, we will start to look for uh, exploratory markers of efficacy, tumor, sh tumor sh shrinkage, for example, in phase one, if, we, if we've got a patient population. Um, Timelines for these sort of studies, 12 to 18 months, two to 4 million US dollars. Um, I've just completed a phase one study um, in, the, in the middle of a pandemic. I, I won't give the indication, but what we got is, is a, um, we got a, no, no deaths, no withdrawals due to serious adverse events, no adverse, uh, serious adverse events. Um, no cause for a study of our patient to withdraw from the study. Uh, but what we did see is adverse events, which were consistent with the pharmacology of the compound. And we got a pharmacology signal. So in my mind, that was a very successful phase one. And it's um, now the real work starts in writing the study report and trying to understand this PK, PD relationships that we, we've got a starting dose range for our phase two to work. Uh, and if we can get to an efficacy signal in our, in our patient studies, then we're off to the races. We have a compound that we can take to phase three. So mid-stage studies, uh, these are larger studies as per my um, introductory slide, there's several hundred uh, patients generally. Here we're trying to obtain initial evidence of efficacy. Uh, we're continuing to collect safety and tolerability data. Uh, we're narrowing the patient population. Uh, we really, and I'll touch on the, on the reason for this later, uh, particularly in oncology tumor types. Uh, we're investigating, confirming appropriate endpoints for our phase three studies and we're optimizing the regimen for phase three. Um, we have our uh, specific studies as well in the phase, phase three range. And these are uh, patient, uh, these are special population studies. Uh, you know, how does the drug work in geriatric and pediatric populations? Uh, how does the drug work in a patient that may have renal and uh, hepatic insufficiency? Do we need, need to do a drug-drug interaction study? And that will be driven off our in vitro enzyme studies. Uh, and I won't go through all those abbreviations, but they're the things that FDA are interested in at IND phase, which is investigational new drug phase. We want to answer that question in, in an ICU, for example, is this drug safe as a poly polytherapy? And, um, and also our thorough QT, QTC studies. Um, they're expensive studies, but it's a hot issue for FDA. Um, it, you've really got to be able to justify the cardiac safety of your drug um, before you get into your phase three studies. So. These, these sort of phase two studies cost uh, are generally two to three years and they're costing between 13 to 15 million USD. And then lastly, pre-approval is our phase three studies. Here we're comparing interventions. Um, if we're working on the European model, these are non-inferiority studies, but more typically if we're, we're centered around an FDA approval, they like to see uh, comparison to placebo. Um, 
this is where you really need to agree your endpoints with the with the key regulators. And I'm not talking small regulators, I'm talking FDA and EMEA. These are the big Western regulators, these are the big markets. Um, we're providing safety and efficacy data for the commercial formulation, um, which is under ICA stability protocols at that time in its commercial packaging. And what we want to show the regulators is, is statistical separation with at least 90% power, two-sided analysis with an alpha of 0.05. Um, we can do an 80% analysis, but typically we're aiming for 90%. Um, now this is old school thinking, but I'll give it to you for the reasons that I'll outline later. Um, FDA likes to see a pivotal study. They like to see a confirmatory study because they want two separate studies that show the same thing conducted by different investigators in different populations in different countries with different sites. It's harder to be fraudulent if you can show two levels of evidence that can be um, analyzed that way. This is why they ask for it. But they will accept data uh, in discussion that it acts as a confirmatory study. So you may have a pivotal study that's a large phase two, you might have a challenge study, um, and then you confirm that evidence with a larger phase three study. So in these phase three programs, we're looking at three to four years and between 20 to 25 million US dollars. And then finally, these are the post-approval studies. This is what we do post-approval. These are questions that remain unanswered from the preclinical approval package. Um, for example, right now I'm doing a special pediatric population study. I have to recruit six months, uh, children under six months of age in Africa, for example. And I, I mentioned the pregnancy registries. Um, here, we're also looking at developing effectiveness of the uh, developing evidence of effectiveness of the intervention in the general population without what I call the training wheels of a, a clinical trial environment. When we sort of expose the general population to this, this drug under normal clinical conditions, is it actually effective in, in managing the disease or preventing the disease? Um, and we're also at this phase of development collecting uh, rare and very adverse events. And you know, topically what we've seen recently with our COVID vaccines is myocarditis and, and TTS. Um, time and cost. It's well, the time is usually tied to your exclusivity period. I always like to negotiate that with regulators. Uh, I don't want to be doing post approval studies after my exclusivity expires. And, uh, you know, our, our cost of our program, for example, was 19 million US dollars post approval. And that's a small compound, it's an ultra orphan indication. So I think this is where I'm trying to infuse some success examples uh, over 20 years of doing this. Um, as uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, I've, I've got eight drugs approved over 20 years. Um, clinical trials are expensive and time consuming. So um, the direct re pre-registration costs, ignoring all the failures and, and all the quotes we get out of Tufts University, the, the direct costs are usually between the 50 to 150 million US dollar mark. It takes an average of eight years to get a drug to uh, through its clinical program. And that's you know in a range of 5.8, five years, depending on your indications. So there's not a lot left on your, your patent uh, clock after that time period. That's just your clinical program. So you're moving quickly and it's an expensive understatement. So prior to even getting into the clinic, uh, you really want to understand the pathophysiology of your disease. Um, it's a leading cause of failure in my mind. Um, you really want to kill a drug, Hamilton, channel, by the way. Okay. Um, you really want to kill a drug quickly and cheaply, especially if you've got early safety signals. Um, you want to really know your dose prior to phase two. So spending time on your PK, PD analysis is important. Um, and then confirming that phase two dose before your phase three. This is a big issue for large pharma. They really want to know that prior to investing in phase three program, you've got the right dose. Um, so you really want to spend time on your critical phase two endpoints, talk to regulators, talk to your experts, um, and spend time on your study designs. I haven't discussed those here. Uh, there's a lot of good study designs in the literature and uh, make sure the regulators will accept those as part of your IND um, end, of, end of phase one, end of phase two meetings. Um, be very specific in your trial population. I think it's better to salami slice with a population and then do post-approval studies to expand that range rather than have a heterogeneous population that you don't meet your endpoint in because that leads to drug failures. Um, and just remember that regulators are quite conservative but they are convinced by good evidence and from earlier studies and a well thought out clinical strategy. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Excellent. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, we'll continue on with our next speaker. Just reminded question and answers at the time online. Feel free to pop your questions in the in the chat box. So our next uh, experienced speaker is uh, Dr. Vanessa Zan from Quotient Sciences, who has uh, over 23 years experience uh, providing biopharmaceuticals, uh, biopharmaceutics support to di uh, discovery, development and clinical programs. Uh, Vanessa has previous experience with uh, AstraZeneca and joined Quotient uh, in 2012 and led the implementation of modeling and simulation has been heavily involved in pharmaceutical sciences um, in this time. So we uh, thanks very much for joining us today, Vanessa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So um, I'm going to talk about first in human studies. So this is um, phase one that Mark has previously told us about. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of clinical trials and historical events that have influenced first in human study designs as we perform them today. I'm going to talk really quickly about the preclinical data that we need to, to have to support us dosing healthy volunteers. Formulation considerations, that's really important. You can kill a drug in a first in human trial with choosing an inappropriate formulation. And I have a case study where this has actually happened. So it's important to consider your formulation properties. And I'm going to talk through standard first in human design. It's a really bog standard one, but it'll give you a flavor. Um, and then talk about formulation dosing strategies. Sorry. So clinical trials, um, there's legislation that came about in 1947, the Nuremberg Code, and this, this was brought about um, following the experimentation uh, by Nazi and Japanese scientists on prisoners of war in the Second World War. So the Nuremberg Code um, was implemented and there's a declaration of Helsinki that was also published in 1964 and there's been numerous updates to that. And basically that's the legislation that helps us govern clinical trials. Mark mentioned good clinical practice. So good clinical practice is an international standard that ensures the quality of the data generated um, and also protects the healthy volunteer. So it's the safety of that subject as well. Um, Australia has its own clinical trial handbook and as Mark said it's very aligned with um, global regulations there's the um, European, Medi Me European Medicines Agency um, first in human guideline and also the ICH um, guideline that Mark mentioned. Now there's been some major safety incidents over the last 90 years that have changed regulations and changed practice and how we conduct these first in humans and the preclinical data package we need to support it. So the first one um, in 1937, this was a compound that was being, um, it was basically an elixir, it was an antibiotic elixir, and it was reformulated with a new solvent, diethylene glycol, which is basically antifreeze. Um, and that resulted in over 100 deaths. So the FDA then passed a bill to say that all new drugs or modifications must be approved. And obviously that has a massive impact on what we do today. Most of you will probably be aware of the worldwide disaster that, that happened around philodomide. That was actually medication that was, admit, was given, prescribed to pregnant women for morning sickness. Um, over 10,000 children were affected. They were born um, uh, missing limbs. And basically the, the preclinical package to support this drug was based on acute tox data alone. So as a result of this, we now have to do multiple dose testing and do repro, repro tox. Now, two more recent examples. Um, the Turgenero incident happened in 2006 in London, and there's the BBC actually made a really interesting presentation about this. Um, they were dosing a, a monoclonal antibody. It was an IV infusion. Um, they dosed six healthy young men. Um, they started dosing man one, five minutes, or I think it was 15 minutes later, dose subject two, then subject three. And by the time they'd got to dosing subject number six, uh, subject number one had collapsed. And basically this um, antibody was meant to stimulate the immune system and they had a massive cytokine storm um, resulting in multiple organ failure in all six of the volunteers. Um, some have recovered. One is still, oh, people lost limbs, uh, sorry, fingers, toes, parts of their feet. One guy's head blew up to the size of a, like twice the size, and it was called like the, the elephant drug. Um, so the EMEA um, in 2007 issued a first in human guideline um, encouraging sponsors to do sentinel dosing. So what I mean by sentinel dosing is you will take one person on active drug, one person on placebo drug. So in a first in human, if you don't dose a placebo, which actually, you know, is just like a, 
a formulation without the active drug. If you don't dose a placebo, any adverse events that you see during that first in human study have to be assigned to your drug. So normally we dose six subjects on active, two on placebo. And with sentinel dosing, we would take one active subject, one placebo subject, randomized, we don't know who's on which, and we dose them 24 hours ahead of the main group or even longer if, if we think that's required. So basically you review them after 24 hours. If they're all still happy, healthy, singing and haven't, haven't collapsed, you can dose the rest of the group. So we do write sentinel dosing into our first in human protocols. Now the next incident is quite recent and some of you may remember this. This was a Bial incident. Um, and actually this is very much focused on the MHRA because Mark um, suggested that maximum tolerated dose is, is an objective um, that, that, that you want to achieve. The MHRA since the BR incident have got really, really nervous. We're not allowed, if we're going through uh, the, the UK or the European agencies, having maximum tolerated dose as an objective is likely to lead us to a grounds for non-acceptance. What basically happened with, with this study is they dosed single doses, they dosed a number of multiple doses in the last multiple ascending dose cohort, um, which was 40 fold higher than the predicted therapeutic dose, um, they had a subject that um, became unconscious. So they shipped him off to hospital. Unbelievably, they continued to dose the rest of the cohort with one subject unconscious. Um, and basically what happened was massive brain damage. One subject died, four others were left with brain damage. And I think one subject, only one out of the six dosed is is remotely healthy today. So um, the EMEA adjusted their guideline in 2017 to, to tighten up on maximum tolerated dose. And I've seen this in the last five years, they've got very tetchy or very conservative about the exposure caps and the levels you can dose. And if you're gonna go above the predicted therapeutic um, dose level or exposure levels, you need to provide scientific justification. So I'm just going to flick over this study really quickly. Um, in order to dose first in human studies, you'll need to do um, safety pharmacology, PK package, toxicology and genotox. So um, the differences in dosing healthy volunteers to patients are that you will need metabolic and plasma protein binding data. You will need a no um, adverse effect level, so no AEL level, and that basically sets your highest exposure levels you can achieve within that first in human study. We'll need two week repeated, um, a, a two, week, two week repeated dose study. They normally end up doing 28 day tox in two species, one rodent, one non-rodent. And we'll also need to do genotox, so looking for gene mutation damage. So something to consider with your first in human study is this formulation. So I know, I know a lot of you here may be working in, in the discovery space, so you'll be doing maybe some in vitro efficacy assays. Um, but a key thing is to consider a formulation because three main reasons that drugs um, fail during clinical development is um, lack of efficacy, tox, and suboptimal PK. So we're not achieving the exposure we want. And bear in mind that animals often don't predict the man. It's a very starry sky plot of correlation with rat and dog data and monkey data to human data. So when you're in the preclinical pre -clinical phase, I think it's really important to look at your biopharmaceutical properties. Um, and there's a really good uh, publication from Butler and Dressman the developability classification system, and it allows you to look at your solubility properties and your permeability properties of your compound, which allows you to do an assessment on the type of formulation and the type of exposure you're likely to see in man. So we look at solubility in fasted state intestinal fluid. So we simulate the fluid that's in our GI tract, and we look at the solubility um, in 500 mils. And we also consider the permeability. So permeability, a drug has to be in solution to be absorbed. Um, and to be absorbed, it has to permeate across the cell membrane. So there are models out there that we can use to measure that. Am I over going time? So this is a really simple schematic that just you would classify your drug based on your permeability and solubility. And then this would drive your formulation strategy. Um, do you want me to stop, stop there? One, one minute. One minute. Um, this is your standard first in human um, protocol design. We've got six SAD cohorts, 
six active, two placebo in each group, a food effect. And then when you get to maybe dose level three, you can um, interleave your MAD. Um, safety and PK are key here. We also are doing more and more studies where we're looking at PDN points, if applicable. We're looking at formulation assessments during first in human as well. We're looking at taste assessments. If you're thinking about a pediatric or a geriatric um, population, or patient population in the future. And we're also doing a lot more continuous halter monitoring, which can allow you to get your thorough QTC biowaivers. Formulation strategy is important. As I said, you pick the wrong formulation, you're, you can basically kill your compound in first in human. And this is a case study. I'm sure the slides will be made available afterwards. You can read this. This is a study, a compound that was owned by company X. They did a first in human study with a really poor drug in capsule formulation. They canned the MAD, they sold the asset on after SAD. The company came to my company and we reformulated it and managed to increase exposure. And this, now, this drug is now being developed for autoimmune disease. Sorry, I got carried away with the first slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks very much, Vanessa. We can come back to you in, uh, in, in question time. Uh, so next up, we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Andrew Harvey. Uh, who's the Director of Partnerships for the Queensland Emory Drug Development Initiative at you know, Uniquest UQ. Uh, and prior, prior to joining Uniquest, uh, Dr. Harvey is the Vice President of Drug Discovery at Bionomics Limited in Adelaide, uh, which is now a publicly listed uh, discovery and uh, development company working across a variety of um, uh, disease states. In this role, he uh, led medicinal chemistry and intellectual property in programs from hit, hit identification through to phase two clinical development. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. So I'm going to step back a bit earlier in the process than the previous speakers and talking about how to select a preclinical ca uh, development candidate and to make sure that by making choosing the best compound, you have the best chance of success when you go into further development. So in considering how to select the best preclinical development candidate or PDC, um, drawing on my experience of working in small molecule drug discovery and development, um, both at Quedi Uniquest and also in my previous industry roles. So I've worked with teams who have made these um, PDC selections across uh, oncology indications, neuroscience, uh, and also in inflammatory disease. So PDC selection within an, an industry setting is a formal process which is framed by re clinical regulatory and commercial objectives for the company. This selection and selecting the best compound allows de-risking for subsequent preclinical and clinical development. And now you may be familiar with the concept of the target product profile. And this is the idea of that, what your final drug looks like, how it performs in terms of efficacy and safety, but also really defining which patient population your drug will treat. What I want to introduce today is the idea of the target candidate profile. And this is what your candidate looks like. So there it's a set of measurable characteristics that are aligned with your ultimate target product profile. So here's an overview of all the steps that are typically involved in a small molecule drug discovery program that get you to that PDC selection at the end. You can see here that after target validation and assay development, we then start looking for the small molecules, the compounds in head identification. So can we, we can be looking at hundreds of thousands of compounds that are evaluated here if you're looking at a high throughput screen. Then moving on to hit to lead and lead optimization, there are hundreds of compounds which are designed and synthesized in the program. And these are evaluated in different experiments. Then we're getting to the pointy end of PDC selection. So once you're looking at efficacy, typically there might be a less than 10 compounds that get evaluated in your efficacy model and building a PK-PD relationship that Mark was talking about earlier. And ultimately, uh, before the selection, you'll be looking at fewer than five compounds that you do preliminary safety pharmacology uh, and a non-GLP tox, typically in rash. So... You can see there's lots of steps in this process. Uh, and how do you know what experiments to do at, at each stage of, of this discovery pipeline? Well, one way of thinking about this is to start with the end in mind and to think about what your drug needs to look like. 
what patients it needs to treat, uh, and what performance characteristics that it needs. So this is the target product profile that I was talking about earlier. Once you've got a clear idea of this, you can then use that to design your target candidate profile, i.e. the experiments that you need to do in the discovery phase to have confidence that your selected candidate will perform to that target product profile. And you'll be building evidence around that translational part during your preclinical and clinical development. So to drill into this concept a bit further, I'm going to show you what a TPP looks like to some extent, uh, and also have the TCP lined up against it. So first of all, we're looking at, in terms of the patient population, as the previous speakers had said, you want to be quite specific about what this population looks like. It's well defined in terms of where they are at the stage of disease, uh, what their prior medications might have been, what this current standard of care is, and how your product would be differentiated. So in having a clear idea of what this looks like, you can then think in the discovery phase, well, how do I select a disease model which represents this patient cohort? And you want to be selecting one which may have had uh, previous examples of successful translation in clinic with other um, compounds or other modalities. You may also have the capacity to be able to work with patient-derived models. And here you can actually use patient samples that are representing the patient cohort that you aim to address. Moving on to efficacy in a TPP setting, this is usually defined in relation of standard of care, either um, equipotent uh, or more efficacious than standard of care. So when you're thinking about what to do in discovery here, you may choose to benchmark your compounds against the most re commercially relevant standard of care that you have that is available to you. You may also wish to, when you're designing your animal studies, to think about whether you can include some endpoints, which may be correlates for registrational endpoints that have been used by previous drugs that have been uh, approved. Moving on to safety, once again, we're thinking about the patient in mind in this TPP. What are some of their potential vulnerabilities in relation to safety? Will the drug be treated uh, used chronically? How will it be administrated? Uh, what are some of the potential safety risks associated with its mechanism of action or its selectivity profile? With all of these in mind, that you can then design the experiments, the safety experiments that you perform in discovery. And the final element here, uh, following on from what Vanessa was talking about, is around what your drug actually looks like as a physical product, how it's dosed, its formulation and stability. So in your TPP, here you're looking at route of administration and how frequently it's administered, um, and also what your product looks like. So it might be a, a tablet that's taken orally, or it may be uh, an, an inhalation product, for example. So knowing this up front sets a set of experiments that you need to perform around physicochemistry, pharmacokinetics, uh, and also pharmaceutical characterization uh, that will help to de-risk for these stages as you move in, into development. So when it comes to selecting a preclinical candidate, ultimately there is no perfect molecule. Not, there is no compound that will tick every single box that you need to, to tick. So it's really a matter of selecting the best profile from those three to five compounds you have that you've had a full set of characterization and discovery and get the best balance that's most likely to de-risk. So you can see here on the left-hand side, some of the activities that are performed preclinically in discovery can then de-risk around your safety assessment, your CMC, your chemistry manufacturing control and preclinical development, and indeed further into the clinic um, and de-risk around dose selection, safety PK. Um, and also you can do some preliminary work around MOA uh, to be able to uh, identify biomarker, biomarkers of response. So all of this, there's, there's a lot of complexity here around this process, and you may be wondering uh, where you might get some advice. So um, the Queensland Emory Drug Discovery Initiative is a partner for small molecule drug discovery. Who work, We work with UQ researchers who would like to take uh, a, a product to market into the clinic. We have a dedicated small molecule drug discovery facility. We translate UQ's biology into drug candidates. 
And we do this effectively, we are a small, small molecule biotech that sits within UQ. So we work with UQ experts and we bring drug discovery scientists who are recruited from industry to work on projects together. So finally, uh, there are many opportunities to work with Query, and the, the main one that we do is working around um, drug discovery projects. And we're always on the lookout for new and differentiated uh, biological targets which have validation and that have products with commercial potential. So if you'd like to have a chat or indeed to be talk about any of these elements of drug discovery, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, and I'd just now like to invite up our uh, final speaker um, for today, and it's Professor Trent Munro, who has uh, over 25 years experience uh, in research and development, uh, including with, uh, with Amgen, and is now the Senior Vice President of Therapeutics at Microba. And in this role, um, uh, Professor Munro uh, leads the therapeutic strategy to progress its drug development programs and pharma partner partnering engagements. And it's quite an extensive bio, but I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> So thanks very much for All coming right, today. Good. All right. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and chat. And, uh, you know, listening to the previous talks, I'm going to deliver some of those same messages, but with a little bit of a focus on some of the gates and uh, things that you really need to be concentrating on as you take your products through. I mean, the other thing you may not realize either, you know, listening in um, is just how important this advice is. So we talk a lot about trying to improve our translation of research uh, here in Australia. And we complain about a lot of different things that we may have or don't have or that we need or we don't have enough money. But I think, you know, you've just been given some absolute nuggets of advice there. So I would just encourage people, um, whether you're listening to this online or you want to point someone in the right direction for listening to what they need to focus on and thinking about drug development, um, you know, hopefully this will be available and, and folks can, can dig in on it. Um, I just came back from uh, a translation conference uh, in Melbourne um, on Monday, and it was really interesting to see how the folks down there are sort of uh, concentrating on things um, and thinking about actually um, setting up academics for success measures based on their ability to not just meet academic measures, but also beat measures of um, trying to progress things beyond um, the research bench. So I think that'll be an interesting discussion um, going forward and is a continuing one. All right, so when we sort of take a traditional view of thinking about how we move technology from one place to another, um, you might be aware that there's a whole bunch of frameworks out there that people talk to. And I think one of the ones that people use uh, right now um, is this technology uh, readiness level model um, where you can set these series of gates and there's some clear descriptions under these and you can Google this and you can go and read about them. I mean, I think this is, is really good. It's a good framework to think about where you sit, um, but it's not really always very helpful. It's like, so what's the so what of that? Like, how do I actually, you know, move from one of those gates to another? What are the things that I need to be thinking about? And so that's, that's um, what you've been hearing about. So my view, I guess, um, having spent both, sides of the fence, um, access academic, and then working in, in companies, is that really um, what we think about in the research lab um, is kind of these pillars, right? So we think about really cool biology where we're the only people in the world who know stuff about this pathway, or we've discovered things that no one knows, or we've read a paper and we've figured out something that no one else has figured out. And I think that's, you know, that's the super exciting part of discovery. We then, um, you know, bring in a PhD student or write a grant or get a postdoc and we um, hammer them home to try and get proof of concept data about, you know, why that must be right, why my idea is, is really good. And then we, we think about, well, if that does play out, then what kind of things do I need to do to then move that somewhere so that I could think about doing clinical studies, right? So that's, that's the way we focus on things. And then what do we think happens next? I think we think two things happens next. One is we cure disease and two is we get a magical big pharma deal and we exit and go and live on an island somewhere, right? So, um, you know, that, that, that's kind of, I think, the way that, you know, if you're a PhD student anyway, and you're thinking you're, you're on this awesome project and it's going to have this amazing, going to create this amazing drug, you know, that, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. I mean, unfortunately, as we're all probably acutely aware, it's not 
really that simple. And as you've heard, um, the number of gates uh, that sit even in between these major boxes or all the decisions that sit underneath these things um, become pretty complicated. So of course, you just heard about what it's like to do lead candidate selection. Um, you've got to do all of those things to even think about then testing into a human. You talked, you heard about, you know, what are the some of the clinical um, boundary conditions that you have to operate on, whether that's how much money you need, um, you know, how you need to design those clinical trials. Um, and then you need to think about commercialization. Like, you know, how, so what? You've got this great drug and you've taken it through clinical trials. Who's going to actually buy it? Who's going to prescribe it? Who's going to pay for it? Um, and that's another whole uh, new level of pain that um, if you haven't been through it, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, and then beyond that, you've got to think about what happens with all the competitions coming up? You know, how are you going to manage this product to be successful, not just at launch, but over the long term? What kind of life cycle management are you going to need to do? Is that going to be changing the formulation or changing the dose or changing the indications or changing the patient population? So that's why, um, you know, really uh, it, it does take a village to develop a product is why it can take such a long time and why it takes so many people and so much money. So I think the figure is something like, you know, up to $2 billion to um, take a drug to market. Now, we've just been through this incredible period of COVID where we've seen products come forward at an incredible pace, you know, think, you know, speed that I wouldn't have believed was possible. But of course, you know, that's a pretty unique situation. And, and I don't think we're going to see that, um, you know, play back into every different therapeutic area. It might have impacts in different, different areas um, and different um, types of things. But, you know, on the whole, it's, it, it's not going to radically change drug development. There are lots of people who are trying to change drug development. So the way that I kind of like to lay on top of this is that to say, look, you know, we've got the basic research side of things. We've got this piece in the middle where there's real opportunity to think about where there's value creation and how we think about taking products forward that help uh, patients. At the end of the day, that's what matters. And then we've got the development paradigm. How do you come out the other side of that and do and do meaningful things? And so, you know, that's my very simplistic way of thinking about all the pieces you need to have in your mind um, and, and what are the first steps? So I just wanted to focus on three things you've heard a little bit about and maybe you know, talk about what I think you need to check off if you're going to take an early stage product uh, into the clinic. And the way I think about that is that there's three major packages that you have to focus on beyond your really exciting biology. One is how strong is your non-clinical package? What are all the things that are, go, go, that, that are going to go into that to make sure that you're ready to go into the clinic. Two, how are you gonna make this product? It's called CMC, Chemistry Manufacturing Controls. What are you going to do to be able to produce suitable material to go into the clinic? And how are you gonna meet the quality requirements um, that, that go alongside of that so that it's suitable for use in humans? And then three, what kind of regulatory framework are you going to be using? Is this going to be in Australia? Is it going to be in the US? Is it going to be in Europe? Is it going to be another jurisdiction? You know, what are the things that go underneath that? So before you run off into the clinic, um, these are just some of the things that I think you should be thinking about. And I'm happy for these slides to be distributed in case anyone wants to, or if you, and then, you you know, there's things or acronyms up here that don't make sense. You can ask in the questions, but what kind of things in non-clinical? Well, all that exciting biology, you know, what led you to do the proof of concept? What kind of mechanism of action are you proposing for this product? Even if you only know a little bit at this earlier stages, um, how are you going to convince either an ethics board or a regulator um, that your product is worthwhile. Uh, you need to have some type of toxicology package. And there's a big barrier for us here in Australia. One, we've only got rodent tox essentially in this country with some limited um, other models. Um, and that's really expensive. And people tend to, you know, that's often a barrier for entry, but it's super important. That stuff will stay with the product for a long, long time. So it needs to be high value. Um, how did you de-risk it? What kind of studies did you do to not get the side effects we heard about? What kind of doses are you thinking? What other safety measures have you looked at under the CMC and the quality? You heard about TPP um, in that last, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is for every single person who's thinking about any type of translational product, spend some time thinking about what a TPP is. If you don't know, ask for help. There's people around that can help you. You must develop a target product profile to understand what you want to do. And then whether it's a target candidate profile, or a quality target profile, target product profile, i.e. what are the properties of your product that flow back into that? You need to be able to, um, to justify that. Manufacturing is also really important. How are you going to address that? 
you know, we have this whole misunderstanding in this country about what GMP is or what GLP is or what those terms even mean. We really uh, mean we really need to run some more, I think, education. Um, manufacturing is not just making a big lot of product. It's it's actually getting it into a form that's suitable for use in the into patients, whether that's a tablet or whether that's a vial, whatever the formulation is, stability you've heard about. Analytics is an area that's terribly undervalued. Um, and then of course, there's the quality side of things. In terms of regulatory, um, you've really got to think about uh, what types of documents are you need to put them together? What templates, who's going to write them? Who do you know that can help with this? Do you need a separate organization to work with you? What's the format of the regulatory path? You're going to need like things like clinical protocols, lab manuals, pharmacy manuals, data management plans. You're going to have to work with a clinical site. So I don't mean to scare people with this, of course, but it's just to say that there are people, I think, locally here in Brisbane, um, within Australia, we've got a really excellent clinical trials framework. We've got people who really know what they're talking about. And I think it's just making those right connections um, and ensuring that you go in eyes wide open. Um, you know, getting funding and all those other barriers, they're things that, you know, are, are challenges as well. But I think it's really important that we raise a bar of what we're doing when we take our products into investigational studies. So with that, um, I'll stop and uh, look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thanks so much, Trent. Uh, we'd just like to invite up our panelists now. We've got three panelists uh, just to talk very quickly for the next couple of minutes um, about their about their journey and how they've traversed these processes. So we've got, uh, first of all, Professor Josephine Forbes and, and, and pop on up to the chairs, uh, who's a group leader here at the MATA Medical Research Institute uh, or MATA Research Institute, UQ. Uh, Professor Ranjani Thomas, yeah, have a, have a seat and... Uh, who's a group leader at the University of Queensland Diamantina Institute, and also uh, Dr. Simon Cassian. Um, and first of all, I'll, I'll get through to you, um, um, Professor Josephine Forbes, um, just to tell us a little bit about um, your experience. Hi, so I'm at Marta Research, and so I've developed um, a couple of different products at various stages. Um, I'm interested in therapeutics which address diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition, probably the most common disease um, which comes about or manifests in early life. I'm also interested in the development of therapeutics for diabetic kidney disease, which is probably the most prominent risk factor for mortality in patients who have diabetes. Two very different disparate areas, um, but I guess We've heard a lot of really important advice today, and I can't thank these people enough. They've really laid out the framework for you. But I think perhaps as a researcher and a more basic scientist, which is you know where I've come from, I've always been embedded in the clinical department. And I think that's been my true advantage is actually understanding what that target product profile really means. Because in diabetes, we have a patient who we you know, might develop diabetic kidney disease, but they are already on 10 drugs. And so you're going to bring in another compound to actually put on top of those 10 drugs. So you're not just actually thinking about whether your drug is efficacious, but also does it interact with those? Are they young people? Are they old people? Type 1 diabetes develops complications such as kidney disease, their children, their adolescents. And then we have right up the other end of the spectrum, we have very old people who develop diabetes, type 2 diabetes, quite a different disease. And yet diabetic kidney disease drugs are all classed in one so I think you really need to get your clinical hat on and go out into the clinic and understand what your disease is and what it means and what every patient who is in that clinic, the challenges, and also from the prescriber's perspective, because, you know, there are important considerations there too. You know, they won't give that to a particular patient group because they can't tolerate it. They can't swallow the medic can't swallow medication. So you're developing a, th a therapeutic, which is an orally available compound, but it's never going to work in that population. So I think that's my best piece of advice for you is even if you're far removed from that, you need to understand where you're going. And, and that gives you your whole map where you're going, if you can understand the, the patient population you're trying to treat. All right. Thanks very much, Josephine. Uh, I'll throw to you, um, um, Professor Thomas. Um, so you've got experience in founding companies uh, and, and moving towards clinical trial. Can you give us some of your perspectives? Um, yeah. So I've translated two immunotherapies through to clinical trials. Is this, is this working? Yep. Um, the first was a cellular therapy and the second was um, a liposome um, uh, that contained two active um, ingredients. Um, both taught me 
um, a lot and <laughs> been through all of that. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I have is that everything costs more money than you think it's going to. And um, you need to be able to source money from non-traditional sources. So you'll never um, get to a clinical trial with product development um, from an academic source of funding. Um, so the um, you need multiple sources generally because it always takes you longer than you think it's going to take, which means you have to pay salaries for longer than you think you're going to have to pay. And um, there are always additional things which you find you come up against when making these decisions um, that you need to pay for. So I think that's my main piece of advice. And I'm happy to um, go into other specifics once we get to the questions. Thanks very much, friend Jenny. And uh, Simon, um, you're the uh, Research Partnership Manager at uh, University of Queensland Diamantina Institute. Can you tell us a little bit about your role? Um, um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, my role in translation is basically um, translating bits of paper off my desk onto other people's desks and, and so the contractual side of those things. Um, in, so my experience is really uh, between or around uh, researchers collaborating with clinicians to, 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 to bring projects um, into the clinic and to translate research from the lab into the clinic. Um, from a, from a contract, and you know, the contracting side of things is reasonably straight forward in terms of the sorts of contracts we do. Um, I think my best advice to give is that really the devil's in the detail and, and the two documents that I spend a lot of time on are the study protocol and the patient consent form. Um, and in those two documents, I've seen really good versions and I've seen some pretty average versions, which is quite frightening because I would have thought, I just assumed people knew how to do them, but it doesn't always work like that. Um, and ambiguity in those documents is a real killer um, because it just means a lot of backwards and forwards. Um, so in the study protocol, you know, what we're looking for is a really detailed account of just exactly what's going on, who is doing what, where, um, who's doing what at what site. I mean, there, you know, often there are more than one site and you can't just assume that the same thing's happening at each site. So you've really got to drill down into the, into the nitty gritty for those things. Um, and the patient consent form is really important, uh, specifically around data. Now, um, universe, certainly the university I work for um, takes data very seriously, certainly research data. If you start talking about personal data, it goes up a level. If you start talking about patient data, it goes up another four levels uh, because that this is a really critical thing that you just can't get wrong. Um, so, you know, who's accessing identifiable data? Where is that going? Who de-identifies that? Who gets access to that? So the movement of data within these projects is a really critical thing to get right. Um, and, and if we don't get it right, there's a lot of conversations that go around and, and nothing goes forward until that's sorted out. So if I could leave one sort of nugget of, of advice would be get those two documents right in the first place and things will go a whole lot better. Excellent. Thanks very much, Simon. I'd now like to invite our uh, four speakers up onto the, the stage to join our panellists. Thanks very much to the panellists. You, you stay right there. <laughs> and uh, so now we've got an opportunity for question and answer uh, to really quiz our experts um, on what it is that they've um, just presented. Um, so, of course, on uh, Zoom, feel free to leave your questions in, in the chat box. Um, but I'll open it up to the floor if there's uh, any, any questions to begin with. If not, I'll, uh, I'll begin. Um, so once again, thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, to, to begin with, um, for Vanessa uh, and, and Mark, um, you really helped delineate some of what's uh, expected uh, in the uh, um, clinical trial process. Uh, wh when's best? Uh, when would you like to be engaged? Uh, at what point um, to begin with? Is that uh, prior to phase one, once the trial's designed? When would you like to see? Some engagement. Um, so from my on. So from my perspective, um, because a lot of the work I do at Quotient is based around formulation optimization and getting the right formulation, I think, you know, please consider that at the preclinical stage. You know, when I joined the industry. 25 years ago, I was brought in as a gatekeeper at AstraZeneca to sit between discovery and development. Discovery in those days were 
um, rewarded on the number of compounds that they got into development. Um, and what they were doing is just solubilizing everything in DMSO, sticking it in an animal, saying it was going to meet our target product profile of greater than 50% absorbed. Um, and we were getting compounds that were coming into the clinic. We were trying to formulate them. We couldn't meet the target product profile. Um, and therefore, we had an eight-year clinical development time. We were, I was working in respiratory and inflammation. We had a one mg per kg um, dose restriction, and it had to be a simple formulation. If you're going to do a modified release or an STD, you're not going to do that in eight years. Um, so we were killing compounds. And so my development department, the clinical department, our KPIs were awful. Um, so I was brought in to be a gatekeeper. So I would sit there at discovery meetings and you know, tell a lot of very cross people that I wasn't going to support it moving into development. Um, the industry has since changed um, its, its perspective on discovery, and now it's much more focused on getting that positive proof of concept. So hopefully we'll work preclinical and clinical development are hopefully working a bit more together but to have that end sight of um, you know what's the clinical formulation going to be what's your target product profile going to be so from my perspective I love reading the IB I love looking at the solubility the permeability data you know I I, I would look have you got pre um subproportional superproportional kinetics in your preclinical species this can tell you a lot about what's going on with absorption and also your clearance mechanisms um you know your your transporter information gives you a key idea as to whether you're going to have to do a ddi study as well so i think it's really interesting to get involved early on yeah mark do you have anything to add i i agree um I'm, I'm, i've just seen you know with manufacturing in particular, there's there's three things that we consider there's death, taxes, and manufacturing issues. I've seen things come off the bench where the reducing agent was hydrazine. We can't use hydrazine at scale. It's it's um it's it's a mutagen. We do genotoxicity studies for a reason. We don't want those sort of compounds in the manufacturing steps. We want synthesis steps six six steps or less. And if you're um, if you're, you're scaling a product manufacturer to commercial scale with hydrazine, best case scenario you're going to have a factory fire. Worst case scenario you're going to blow up your factory. So you, you want to bring people in early to start looking at okay, how are you going to make this compound? Is it you know is it druggable? You know as as Vanessa's just mentioned, and then it's trying to avoid all the traps that will, as uh, Regini said, will prolong your program, make it cost more. Um, you know. Soak up the time which your patents ex excluding uh, expiring on. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. It's one other thing about formulation, and that is that if you put effort into that, into getting a good formulation, then you may have a unique formulation which adds to your intellectual property value. So I think it's really, really important from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think also you can make good cases to ethics committees to actually do like oral formulation studies and things. I know sometimes they're, for example, in diabetic kidney disease, they're very long studies. And so they're much more, I guess, um, so to let us do them for a long time, but that's the reality of the disease. And if you can justify that that's where it needs to go, you need to understand that PK and safety over a long period of time, then they're very, um, uh, they're very helpful. So, you know, you need to consider those things early. It's just do you just it just makes you do two studies instead of one. And that again, that goes back to the money factor. It's uh MRA at Rangini Thomas Group. Uh, my question goes uh, in this formulation. I was wondering if I we should uh, test and evaluate. Uh, each compound of the formulation individually, or we need to evaluate the formulation as a whole uh, thing. Sorry, so, the, um, so you're asking me if we needed to evaluate each formulation component individually. Is that yeah. the tox you're talking about? Yeah. So if you're using grass except excipients, you don't need to do that. Okay, and you don't have to have the same tox formulation. That doesn't have to end up being the formulation you dose in your first inhuman. All right. Okay, it's important if you're going to take something like a lipidic formulation into your first inhuman, um, it's important to consider your recommended daily allowance. So a lot of sponsors come to us and they've got a great formulation and we look at the, you know, the first inhuman 
projected dose range in their formulation, it's like, well, it's going to get you to dose level three because you're going to exceed your RDA. You're going to end up with GI side effects. Um, so it, so you, you'll have at your um, fingertips, a, at the FDA, I've got a grass database base of excipients and levels that you can use. Um, if you're doing a combination drug product, so two different pro drug products, that's different. Sorry, two different APIs. You would have to do combination talks normally to support going into man with that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. Um, just a second question. Um, if in, in the first stages of the clinical trial, we realize needs to change something in the formulation, uh, is that a thing that is possible? Um, actually, that, that really sort of... Um, place what my company does we have um gmp manufacturing facilities co-located with a clinical unit so we're doing more and more i've just actually submitted a poster for the aops in boston and the last 25 um first in human studies we've done 23 of them have had formulation flexibility so not only to be able to change the dose you're giving but to be able to change um, excipients within those formulations so we're doing more and more studies especially for poorly soluble compounds where we will maybe start with a crystalline suspension um, we'll dose to dose level three so we're, we're defining our pk and our half life um, then at dose level three we would either bring separate cohorts of subjects or bring the same cohort subject back and allow them to have two other formulations. So I just actually at 2 a.m. this morning did a CSR key messages meeting on the study that's just done this. So we've dosed a, a spray dried dispersion and a hot melt extru extrusion suspension. So they're amorphous forms of the API, which will lead to higher solubility. Um, so we dose those at dose level three. We then looked at the PK data and selected the SDD formulation because it had the best exposure to continue to dose escalate for SAD and MAD. And we're actually developing an SDD sachet formulation because it's um, going to be tested in ALS patients. So if you, yeah, you, you can test alternative formulations in a first in human setting if you have the appropriate um, CMC package and stability package and you have a provider that can generate those formulations quick enough. So we would typically generate a small batch or manufacture a small batch, 200 tablets, 200 units with seven days stability and dose them in the first in human study. So it's a bit of a different model to conventional first in human where you're either compounding in a pharmacy or you're picking your fixed units, um, getting a CDMO to manufacture them with you know, appropriate stability, maybe six months to cover your trial. So it's a bit of a different model, but you can, you can, assess formulation performance during first in human. That's perfect. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Trent, uh, you have uh, gave us a great um, presentation there. And I think as scientists, we all like to think that we can end up on that island at some point in time. Um, but, a, but a take home point for me was <laughs> seeking out that education. So seminars such as this, you get a chance to speak with the experts. Uh, can you point us in a few other directions just to help us um, uh, identify what it is that we don't know? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I guess, being back in Australia for the last three years or so, it's really highlighted to me just how many people there are locally that do have the expertise, you know, whether that be clinicians that are so important in gathering feedback of whether this is even a good idea, all the way through to people who can help with the underlying, whether it's medicinal chemistry or design of the molecule or discovery of the molecule. So. I don't think maybe that's one of the things to consider. What does that you know one-stop shop look like in terms of the different folks who sit into the different buckets that you can act, actually access? And maybe it's a little bit easier for someone who works in that space and deals with those people all the time to think about how you'd go about it. So um, you know that's probably an action item I think to think about how do we draw up those kind of resources. I would say on the clinical side, um, you know we're very lucky in Australia to have a number of really good. Uh, CROs that support clinical studies, and they've got pretty good networks of experts that you can tap into. So uh, not, that didn't really answer your question precisely, but um, you know, it's it's really just piecing those pieces together. I think little bit by little bit, and figuring out who you can talk to. And I think one way to really go about is to find people who've been through the clinical experience, and then uh, work off their connections as well. I suppose that that brings in uh, Andrew with uh, with your expertise. 
Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, uh, people are more than welcome to, to reach out to us if you're thinking about small molecule drug discovery and would like to have a chat. But I'd also like to point out some of the new funding models that are coming through from the federal government. So um, we've been involved very heavily as partners in a couple of these. This is the uh, Biomedical Translational Bridge and the Targeted uh, Translation Research Accelerator. Uh, there's also Curator now as well. What's new about these programs is that they deliver funding, definitely, for translation, but also what comes with that is access to expertise to support you on that translational journey. And so our role, for example, in those first two programs is to act as mentors for awardees. So we, we meet with people and see how they're going towards that path toward the clinic or around clinical design and have a discussion, bring in commercialization experts, uh, bring in modality experts as well. So hopefully this continues to be a, a way that, that um, translational funding moves in this direction. Fantastic, thanks very much. I just mentioned as well, I am, um, our spin-off company was lucky enough to partner with Johnson & Johnson for eight and a half years. And that's really where I learned so much because when you partner with um, pharmaceutical industry, they'll basically bring in all of that expertise mm -hmm. around you. And you're not expected to know everything, but you will learn it and you'll make the contacts. And then those contacts actually end up moving around the world in different parts, you know, doing different things. And you've always got them. You can always call on that expertise. So nobody minds being asked to help. Um, no matter where they are in the world, you can just reach out and ask people questions. And if they don't know, they'll help you because everybody wants to see good outcomes for, for patients and trials. So that's, that's my advice. Can I also add to that? Um, you don't necessarily have to reinvent a new compound. And so it's really important to understand what's in the space that you're in and to identify biotech companies who may have already developed these compounds, number one, for another indication, but also that they have, may have early portfolios of different compounds that you can utilise and, and actually repurpose. And what comes with that, though, is the expertise of those companies because often they're very strict around what you can utilize these compounds for, what the pathway is like, and which you have to do along each step of the process. And it's a good place to start uh, rather than jumping off the with the parachute like, <laughs> like Trent and Company. As you can see, it's a really long pathway. And so it's, it's a good place to whet your appetite is with a small biotech company. I just wanted to um, add something as well that Professor Thomas said about time and money. Everything takes longer and costs more. Um, the situation is only getting much worse post-COVID. So we have a capsule shell shortage in the world, believe it or not. Um, we also have 14C um, carbon that is used for at human ADME studies. The sole supplier is from Russia. So we have a year's of that left that's been distributed to the companies that run ADME studies. So you have to do an ADME study to get your drug on the market. So at the moment, I think, I think there's somewhere in Europe and um, England are looking to potentially be able to generate 14 C carbon because Russia's cut the supply off. Um, GLP tox studies, it's easier to get a clinic, it's faster to get a clinical trial started at the moment than it is to get a slot for a GLP 28 day top study. So everything is just getting slower and costing much more, I think, post COVID. Um, and we're really resource constraint as well. That's just, if anyone needs an ADME study, get it booked now. And the cost of everything has gone up, not double, but you know, up to tenfold more than before. Well, if there are no further questions online or in person, uh, it's been a fantastic discussion and I'd like to really thank speakers and the panelists for your time today and uh, your presentation. Um, and that just leaves us to, um, to as a group, thank uh, our speakers and thank you all for your attention. Thanks again. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Guys. No problem.